Is there a kid who wants to come up and see me? Oh, we got two, we got two this morning. So you guys know that it's Memorial Day tomorrow. And what do we do on Memorial Day? What's Memorial Day about? Do you know? Did you learn this in school? Not yet? Did you learn anything about that in school? Well, sometimes uh, people like to honor veterans in, on Memorial Day. On Memorial Day. Uh, but that's really not what it's about. It's a time to remember the people who have died for our country. And that's why we keep talking about these services at the, uh, at the cemetery down the road. Because they will come and um, have a song and, and say a prayer, right, um, for those people. And maybe plant some flags and play a song called Hats. Which is how we remember. Okay. Now, here's what I want you to know today. War is a terrible thing. Um, sometimes we're tempted to think that it's really cool and glorious and you get to shoot a gun and prove how brave you are. It's awful. It's scary, and people die, and there's really nothing good about it. But, if you guys decide that you want to go into the military when you get older, you do? Okay. Then we will support you, and we will love you, and we will honor you, which means that we'll say, good job. But I hope, I hope that you never have to go to war, even if you are in the military. I have a, a brother-in-law, that's my sister's husband, and he was in the military, and he served in Iraq. Yes, he was there twice. And we felt so scared for him while he was gone. And I hope you and your family don't have Okay. Now that's, you might think, oh, that's sort of an odd message for church. But we talk about Jesus as the Prince of Peace. And he wants peace in all the world. God is a King of Peace. That is right. And so we hope and we pray for peace always. Fair enough? Okay. Let's pray. God, give us peace in our hearts and in our minds and in our world. That we never have to know war or upset of any kind. Because we pray to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Many blessings to you kids. We will see you after church.
So, so far, this seems appropriate enough, right? We're going to talk about a military guy on a weekend when we remember military people. We remember, in fact, the, uh, the men and women this weekend uh, who sacrificed their lives uh, to our nation. And we remember those people as heroes. But centurions would have been considered nearly the opposite by Jesus and his friends. Yeah, oh, oh, sure, you know, sure. They were uh, thought of as brave individuals. In fact, that's often how they, they got to the commands for acts of bravery. They led the battles that they fought in from the front, uh, wading into combat alongside the men that they commanded. But in Palestine, they were the backbone of an occupying army that had no qualms about using violence to get its way. If you saw a centurion coming, the smart thing to do was to turn and walk away ever as quickly as you could. The guy who could make you, remember how Jesus says, if someone makes you walk a mile, you go the extra mile for them. The guy that could make you walk that mile was a centurion. The guy who carried around a big stick with which he could beat even a Roman citizen who got out of line, that was a centurion. The guy who commanded the men who crucified Jesus, that was a centurion. Centurions were scary and they were the enemy. But, but apparently, they're not all bad. The centurion mentioned here, um, and in the parallel story in the Gospel of Matthew, um, he gets along with the Jewish elders in his neighborhood, and in fact, he pays for them to build their synagogue. And then there's Cornelius, the centurion that, uh, that Peter is sent out to convert in the book of Acts. So apparently they're, they're not all bad, and some of them do get along with the people in Israel. Still, they were the enemy to most Jews. Uh, they were these symbols of repression and ritual uncleanness in the land of Israel. And that's even more so the case for Christians who uh, began as a strictly pacifist sect. If you can believe it, um, uh, dig this. Uh, for the first 200, 300 years of Christianity, there was an enormous debate about whether soldiers of any kind could be Christians. Some people said, if you're a soldier, even if you are an ex-soldier, you cannot be a Christian. That's how seriously they took their commitment to pacifism. So while the centurion mentioned in today's gospel lesson um, does have some uh, redeeming characteristics, it's really kind of odd to hear Jesus complimenting his faith. I mean, I, I, I struggle to find uh, a a more recent parallel for this. It's not quite like uh, somebody, uh, uh, an American soldier in Iraq, uh, complimenting a terrorist leader. Sort of like somebody in Poland complimenting the faith of a Soviet soldier. Now, on the other hand, though, Jesus did just tell his followers, love your enemies, turn the other cheek. If somebody takes your coat, give your shirt as well. So here's, you know, here's a test case for what he's saying. Will Jesus show love even to a centurion, the very symbol of Rome's brutality and exploitation of the people of Israel? Well, yes. Yes, he will. Not only that, but he tells his followers, this guy has more faith than even you Jews. Even you people who are supposed to... I'm sorry, I shouldn't point that out. Even you people 
who are supposed to have the greatest faith in the world, this centurion is dead. This, shall we say, is not the way to make himself popular with the crowds. Now, one of the, the rules of thumb for making sense of a story in the gospel is to ask for whom it is written. Who is supposed to get the message here? And you might think that it's the disciples uh, who are supposed to, to learn from this, but no, they've already lived the story. They don't need to hear it again. Now, this one is for Luke's people, and by extension, us. And Luke's people who were wrapping their heads around the idea that the good news of Jesus Christ uh, just might be available to more people than only the Jewish ones. These are the people going out to the Gentiles to convert them. And Luke tells them it's more than okay to do so. It's exactly what they should be doing as Christians. And don't forget, he says, don't forget as you go out to convert these Gentiles, even Romans might make good Christians. Even a centurion, your sworn enemy, might make a good Christian. Now, we could have a long and interesting discussion about who uh, might be a Christian's enemy uh, these days and, and why and how we ought to respond. But I think it's actually more interesting uh, to turn things around and try to see them from the centurion's perspective, so to speak. Let me, let me explain it to you this way. A friend who studies uh, digital ministry, she calls it, online uh, forms of ministry, when she talks about what she calls lakes, which is listening, accepting, or uh, I'm sorry, I always want to say accepting, it's listening, attending, which is noticing and being present to people, connecting, and engaging, which is building relationships with them. And those practices are how real ministry gets done online, my friend believes. But if you start to think about it, they're the same way any kind of ministry happens, isn't it? Right? Doesn't matter whether it's online or off, these are the same things everyone needs from interaction with other people. Even the centurion needs this. The centurion needs Jesus to listen to his plea without rejecting it out of him. He needs Jesus to attend to the needs of his slave. He needs Jesus to connect to him across that social boundary. And he needs him, if not exactly to build a long-lasting friendship, then to at least meet him where he's at. I'm reaching out to you, Jesus. Reach out in return. You don't even need to come over. He tells Jesus, long distance is just fine because I know you and I, and, and I know that you and I have enough in common that you can heal this man. That's engagement. You didn't know that the Bible talked about online ministry, did you? Lakes, listening, attending, connecting, Engage. That's what we all need. You'll hear me talk about that again. We spent a, a fair amount of time at the uh, shift meeting this past Wednesday talking about the people out there, out there in the world, uh, who feel disconnected and even alienated from the church. What, what did Sue Schultz say, right? They don't even know how to come to church. And they don't know what they would do if they did come to church. They don't know how to have faith. And I'm sure you know how many of those same people feel disconnected and even alienated in their own lives. They might, you know, this might not be a conscious thought for them. But on some level, we all know that it's more and more difficult to meet our needs to be in community, it, it just gets more and more difficult these days 
to meet those kinds of needs, to be with other people, to be joined with them in community. And that's why we're here today. In church, when we could be up north or out on the boat, right? And yet here we come together as a family. You people get gold stickers for coming this morning. <laughs> we know that we need somebody to listen to us, to pay attention to us, to connect us as uh, uh, connect us to our friends and our family, to engage with us in a meaningful way. If we didn't want those things, um, we'd go off to a, to a big church where we could be anonymous. Or maybe we just uh, stay home and watch TV, play on the internet. But you and I, we know that we need our church family, and that's what drives us here on this hot, sticky summer morning. That's not going to prevent you from bolting out of here as soon as you can to get away from how humid it is. But that's what drives us here. Now many people have perfectly happy lives uh, without a church community, to be honest. Some of them live and die without the church, and that's just fine. That's their business. Some of them discover their need when a crisis erupts in their lives, and that's the centurion. He didn't realize that he needed to be considered a part of the family of Israel until his servant got sick. And some people uh, know, they don't even know that they need more to their life, even if they're not sure what that more is. They just know that they need something out there. And those, are, those last two are the people that we're interested in because they know that they need to know God. What gives the centurion such remarkable faith is that he knows that he needs Jesus. He knows that he needs Jesus and he is willing to admit it. He is willing to humble himself and trust in uh, Jesus' power to heal even though he's supposed to be Jesus' enemy. He needs Jesus, and he knows it. It's fair to ask if we know the same thing, if we're willing to admit it. It's so easy to pretend like you have everything under control until you don't. And friends, I know a thing or two about pretending to have everything under control even as the wheels are coming off my life. I've been But remember this, uh, who this lesson was written for. Not for the disciples, not for the centurion, not for us. It was written for the people of Luke's church who were struggling with the idea of reaching out to people who were very different than them. That's the work of the church in every time and every place. And it's the work to which we need to set ourselves again and again. Love your enemies, Jesus says, to which we might add, love the people who don't know how much they need Jesus. If I understand uh, what people were saying at the meeting on Wednesday night, the good news is that we're actually in a pretty good place uh, to love those people out there. We are good at being church family, right? Mm. <laughs> Come on, this is what you people tell me, right? Yes. We're good at being a church family. We're good at listening, attending, connecting, and engaging one another. Now the trick is to take that skill, that gift, out into the wider world. Not to, not to sell people on it, but to let them know who we are in this community and how much love we have in this community and take that out to the world. To do it 
for and with the people who need it out there. I think we can do it. We just have to figure out how we're going to do it and get going. Because if Jesus can work with the centurion, the enemy, capital T, capital E, we can work with a few lost souls who need somebody to love them. That's what we're here for. And in the long run, offering that love is what's going to heal us too. Amen.